Let me ask you a question. If you want to know how good is your smartphone performing, what would you do? I think you would probably use these kind of benchmarks like Geekbench or 3D Mark or maybe Antutu, and you will receive a score from these tools to indicate how fast is your phone. But what if I tell you this is not the right way to look at it? You're actually missing a lot of things if you only look at the score. For example, we have a Samsung S22 powered by Snapdragon 8, a very new chip on the market, and we have a OnePlus 7 Pro, which is a three years old model with an old school Snapdragon 855 inside. If you look at the benchmark numbers, it might look like S22 is absolutely destroying this old lady here. I mean, it sounds reasonable, right? Snapdragon 8 versus 855, there's no way you can lose it, right? But in reality, if we play some heavy games like Genshin Impact, this old OnePlus will actually outperform S22. Why? I hear you asking. Well, on the surface level, it seems like uh, Samsung has tuned down this Snapdragon 8 chip a lot, so it will run at a pretty low frequency when we play in the game. Meanwhile, this old OnePlus is running at a relatively higher frequency, and this gives older phone a chance to surpass these latest flagships. And that's why you shouldn't purely listen to the benchmarks, because Benchmarks only indicates peak performance of the highest CPU frequency of your phone, which according to my stats only stands for less than 1% of the total use case of your phone. Yeah, normally your phone is always running way lower than the peak. And honestly, I don't blame any manufacturers for doing this because I totally get it. It's all about battery life. It's all about thermal control, right? Smartphone is not like a desktop PC. You don't have unlimited power and you don't have something like a active cooling. So you don't want to spend all your 50 calibers on a couple few rads, right? You want to organize your battery and thermal resources wisely. And that's why we have CPU governors and DVFS dynamically controlling your CPU behavior, keeping it calm for most time and only use the power when necessary. But here comes the problem. If the benchmark numbers, the peak performance, is not the right thing to look at, then how should we know which CPU is better? What should we look at? Well, there is something you should care about. It's called power efficiency. This is super important. I might argue this is the most important thing of your smartphone chip. And for that, I did tons of tests to draw you this, a huge chart of curves about power efficiency of your smartphone. How crazy is that? I am so excited to explain that to you, but before that, make sure to subscribe to our channel and it will definitely motivate us to make more great content like this. Okay, let me explain. Most of us didn't realize that power efficiency actually indicates the real performance in the smartphone world. Because your smartphone is only having a certain amount of thermal capacity. Let's say it can only deal with 5 watt of heat for a longer term. Then, who's the better one here? It's the one reaching the highest point under 5 watts in this case. Or you want to find the best CPU for daily usage for battery life, you can set a line on a certain performance and see which platform draws less power to reach this particular performance. And generally speaking, the curve closer to the left upside is better. Well, maybe you need some time to swallow this, but it is useful, right? So how did we make it? How we draw these curves? Well, this part could be a bit nerdy, so feel free to skip it if you don't want to hear all the craps. We're basically testing Geekbench scores and the power draw under different CPU status. So first of all, we need to control our CPU behaviors, right? We need to set our CPU not only to the peak performance, but also to low clock speed or medium clock speed or anywhere between. On Android, we can use some kernel management apps after routing the phone so we can set the CPU frequency directly. It couldn't be too hard. But for iPhones, we need to jailbreak iOS to access the thermal monitor file in their system folder. And then we can play around with all these performance settings. It's actually quite fun. We can change the target CPU power or GPU power under low power mode. So you can't directly control CPU frequency, but we can do that in different fashion. 
By the way, since jailbreaking is required, we can't draw that curve for a 15 device because jailbreaking for iOS 15 isn't there yet. After controlling the CPUs, we're gonna think about power measurement. How should we know the power consumption of these babies? After all, benchmark tools won't tell us about power numbers, right? Actually, there is an easy pass because both Android and iOS provides power data that you can read from the SDK. And we can just use software to read them. But the problem is the sample rate is just too low. Geekbench is a benchmark suit containing a bunch of different sections. And some of those sections only last a very short amount of time. And if your sample rate is not high enough, you just couldn't get the right power number of those sections. So we did it the hard way by tearing the phones down and use a dummy battery directly powered by a stabilized voltage supplier here. It's called Power Monitor, and we use that to measure the total power consumption of our smartphone. What we're looking for is the motherboard power consumption. So besides total power draw, we also need to measure the display power draw of each individual phone. And after some calculation, there you have it. Ah, I don't know if you can understand all these things, but anyway, let's just get back to the chart. Okay, so what can we read from this chart? This is a bit complicated, but let's try to understand things one by one. First, let's talk about Qualcomm. How is Qualcomm doing in terms of power efficiency of their Snapdragon flagship phones? Actually, it might be very different than you think. Every single year, Qualcomm will show us some keynotes claiming variety of improvements of their latest chips. So naturally, you'll think they keep evolving, right? They're going forward every year, right? No, they're not. Qualcomm used to live up to the promise. They had some bad times during Snapdragon 810 era, but most of their products are solid. Until Snapdragon 888. As you can see here, the old one, Snapdragon 865, is actually quite decent. Indeed, providing some improvements upon 855. But when 888 launched, it's not improving at all. It's going backward. It's worse than 865 in terms of CPU power efficiency, which means if you give them the same amount of power, 865 will probably outperform 888. And the bizarre thing didn't just stop there. One year later, when Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 came out, it's even worse than 888. Look at this, especially on the lower end. Snapdragon 8 could barely win the fight with an 855, a three years old veteran. The only thing Snapdragon 8 and 888 really improved is their peak performance. So by benchmarks, you won't even notice anything wrong. But look at these peak points. Do you even realize how much power they're drawing from that thing? Over 10 watts by the peak. This is like an Intel chip in a f***ing smartphone. Jesus Christ, this is just way too ridiculous. Fortunately for the latest gen Snapdragon 8 Plus, which just arrives a few months ago, it does improve a lot. I mean, considering how bad is Snapdragon 8, it's not a surprise they want to turn things around, right? So good for you, Qualcomm. Finally remember how to go forward. <laughs> Another interesting one is A70. Spec-wise, A70 is based on A65 with some minor overclocking, but in reality, they act a bit differently. A70 is slightly worse than A65 on high clock speed range, while remaining the same on mid and lower end. I assume they might have a different voltage table to support A70's overclock attempt, but that's not a big problem because like I said, high clock doesn't matter on smartphone. You won't even use them outside benchmarks. So based on mid and the lower part, A70 is basically A65. Well, looks like Qualcomm has suffered a lot in recent years, but what about their biggest rival? How is Apple doing? Actually, they're doing very well. They're dominating this market. Look at how even A14 is better than anything Qualcomm provides here. The interesting thing is, just right until 2020, Apple was not even leading that much in the competition. As you can see, Snapdragon A55 is not far off comparing to A12, and A13 is just a bit better than A65. So nothing crazy here. Apple 
Apple just keeps evolving healthily every generation or so. And now look at that. They're just two generations ahead of Qualcomm. By the way, we can't draw that curve for A15 device, but we do manage to give you some hints by several points. This is the peak point, and this is the low power mode. So you kind of know where it is. A15 is actually not a huge jump on A14 in terms of CPU. It takes use of a slightly better architecture and a slightly better fabricating process. And overall, it's just a mild update on CPU, but still way ahead of Qualcomm anyway. So Apple is kind of destroying Qualcomm on CPU, but as we all know, Qualcomm is not the only player in Team Androids. So what about other guys like Samsung? We know Samsung makes their own in-house Exynos series. If you buy Galaxy phones in Europe, you might end up with these Exynos variants instead of Qualcomm ones. So how good is Exynos? Can they keep up with Qualcomm or even Apple? No. Somehow, Exynos managed to do even worse during these tough years of Snapdragon. Not only did Exynos 2200 perform worse than the older 2100, but also both of them gained no advantage in competition, especially for the high clock speed range. Exynos 2200 even draws an astonishing 12 watts of power for its peak performance. But for mid to low frequency, they perform similar to Qualcomm. And that's why in many reviews, Exynos and Samsung variants of the same Galaxy phone are getting pretty close at battery life. I must say, keeping up with Qualcomm is already quite decent by Samsung standard because they are doing even worse before. I didn't even bother bringing up Exynos 990 here as a contender, but I can assure you that one is pretty much a nightmare. Speaking of making their own chips, what about Google? How is their Tensor chips in Pixel 6 doing? Long story short, it's a piece of sh Sorry for the language. But it's just so bad. It doesn't have a proper peak performance and it doesn't have a proper power efficiency. It's even worse than the Snapdragon 855, which is the one they used in Pixel 4. I know Tensor is their first attempt and we shouldn't be too harsh on that, but you consumers are the one paying for the price. So at least you have the right to know they're not so good. And finally, let's talk about the underdog, MediaTek. MediaTek has never really ties with the word high-end because they never really have the ability to make a flagship product in the past. When we think about MediaTek, it's always about bang for the bucks, it's always about cheaper phones, right? But this year, they actually launched some awesome beefy stuff. The Dimensity 9000 is their first attempt to the high-end market, and in terms of power efficiency, it's doing fine, getting very close to the best offer of Qualcomm, which is the Snapdragon 8 Plus. Not bad, right? Right? But this is not even the best thing we are getting here. Take a look at the Dimensity 8100, which is a sub-high-end product for flagship killers. And it is literally killing flagships. I mean, it's doing better than their own Dimensity 9000 and outperforming anything Qualcomm has ever released, including the latest Snapdragon 8 Plus. Its CPU power efficiency is actually very close to Apple's A14, which is pretty impressive. Considering where they're standing a couple few years ago, that is some awesome fight back from MediaTek. And that's what we call the ultimate underdog. So these are the datas we got for multi-core power efficiency. But I'm wondering why? Why is Qualcomm and Samsung being stagnated? Why are they lacking behind Apple so much? And why would a flagship killer instead actually killing flagships? It doesn't make any sense until we extended our entire test to single core. We draw the same power efficiency curve for each and every kind of core of these platforms, just to find out what really happens to these smartphone CPUs. And we find something very interesting. Essentially speaking, the chaos is mainly caused by two factors. One is ARM didn't live up to the promise for their new CPU microarchitecture. And the other thing is Samsung did a poor job at manufacturing chips comparing to TSMC. If we look at the materials ARM is giving us, it doesn't seem like they're having any problems, right? But the thing is, the Cortex-A710, the new performance core ARM is offering, kind of goes backward when it comes to power efficiency. Look at the curves here, from A76 to A77 to A78, looks like they're constantly improving, which is reasonable. New architectures should be better, right? 
Keep in mind these are from different platforms, so you can argue there might be other factors like uh, fabrication. But anyway, the whole package is indeed getting better and better until we came up with the A710. Despite using an even better fabricating process, A710 somehow lose the battle against A78. In fact, the A710 inside Dimensity 9000 is actually closer to A77 in Snapdragon 865, which is made by an inferior 7 nanometer process. And this is not a special case. We also test Snapdragon 8, and it is in the exact same situation, lacking behind the A78 of Snapdragon 888. This new performance core A710 is really not looking promising. Meanwhile, the Cortex-X2, the new prime core, the big daddy, is actually not that bad. Well, it's not improving much comparing to X1, but luckily it's not entirely going backward like A710 did. So, still acceptable, I guess? But unfortunately, A710 is not the only shit show going on here. You should also worry about A510, the new efficiency cores. According to our test, the A510 is way worse than the last gen A55, which is already four years old. I mean, this is really embarrassing. Can you imagine after selling the same old product for four years, and finally you're launching a new lineup, and instead of improving things, you're downgrading. How bizarre is that? The lackluster efficiency of A510 will probably worsen your daily battery life, and an underperforming A710 will make things worse, or make things warmer, let's say, when your phone is facing tough tasks like big apps or games. So ARM's CPU design is a huge reason why Snapdragon 8 and Exynos 2200 is so bad at power efficiency. But it's not the only reason. It's not even the biggest reason from my point of view. Let me introduce you the real super villain, Samsung. Some of you might already know both Snapdragon A55 and A65 are manufactured by TSMC using 7 nanometer process. But since Snapdragon 888, Qualcomm has turned to Samsung for help using their advanced 5 nanometer and 4 nanometer process to make 888 and the Snapdragon 8. And that didn't age well. This is the single core power efficiency of Snapdragon 888, which is Samsung fabricated. And this is the Moon City A100, which is made by TSMC. They both had the A78 cores, and you can see the gap is just so huge. The TSMC made 8100 is way better than the Samsung made 888. And the A78 on 888 can't even compete with the A77 on A65, which indicates Samsung's 5 nanometer is even a lot worse than TSMC's 7 nanometer in terms of power efficiency of the final product. That could definitely tell you one thing or two about Samsung's fabrication. The more obvious example here would be Snapdragon 8 and Snapdragon 8 Plus. These two have exactly the same spec and the same design, with one being made by Samsung and other from TSMC. And you can see there's almost two generations of improvements from A+. Just look at the gap! Can you even believe this is just because they switched the fab? Wow, that is mind-blowing! I guess now you kind of understand where the CPU part of these chips actually stands. So maybe it's time to talk about GPU, another very important part in your smartphone chip. In the world of PC, you'll probably think GPU is crucial for gaming. But actually, in terms of use cases, smartphone GPUs are quite different from PC graphics cards. Unlike PC, you will probably never run your games flat out on the smartphones, and your GPU will probably work at a very low clock speed with a mild GPU usage. For example, Snapdragon 8 Plus is capable of 900 MHz as its highest GPU frequency, but in reality when we are playing Genshin Impact, even though it's a pretty demanding game, you can still barely see the GPU over 400 MHz. It's using less than half the GPU power, yet still left plenty of headroom as you can see. 
It's not like filmmakers don't want to give you more frame rates in games, but a higher GPU clock speed does not necessarily bring higher frame rate to your smartphone titles. Like in Genshin Impact, the performance bottleneck is always on the CPU side due to the driver overhead, so GPU performance doesn't really matter when your CPU is way behind demand. Unless you're using some super low end stuff. Not to mention for most mobile games, you'll probably have a fixed frame rate at 30 or 60 FPS for power saving or thermal reasons, and a better GPU won't break that limit for you. So what really matters is the GPU power consumption of low to mid-range clock speed. And the only scenario where peak GPU performance matters is the emulators, where you set a super high resolution like a 1440p or 4K in Dolphin Emulator or Ether SX2. So really, GPU is not that important for smartphone gaming comparing to PC. But still, we're gonna look at their power efficiency data to figure out who's the best. The benchmark tool we're using here is the GFX Bench Aztec Ruins 1440p off-screen scene. We use Vulkan API for Team Android and Metal for iPhones. Just like what we did to compare CPU workloads, we drew the GPU power efficiency curve by running benchmarks under every frequency point of these GPUs. And what we got here is some pretty interesting results. Still, let's focus on Qualcomm first. So this is 855, this is A65 and A70, they're basically the same thing. And this is the poor triple eight. And this is Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, and also 8 Plus Gen 1 here. Different from their CPU, Qualcomm actually designed their own GPU architecture. By not relying on someone else, their GPU are indeed pretty competitive. With the only exception of Triple Eight, which really suffers from Samsung's fabrication. As for the Snapdragon 8, Qualcomm actually introduced a new generation of GPU architecture this year, which is Adreno 700 series. And we can see the improvements is quite crazy, even with the debuff from Samsung. Not to mention the TSMC-powered Snapdragon 8 Plus, which really delivers some awesome GPU power efficiency here. That looks pretty decent. And now, let's talk about Apple. How good are the GPUs in these iPhones? Well, it looks like they've been dominating the game for a pretty long time. Back in 2018, when A12 was launched, Android competitors can barely catch up with its powerful GPU. The A55 is lacking way behind that thing. And even the A65, which was launched a year later in late 2019, still couldn't win the battle. And by that time, Apple already launched A13, which really beat shit out of everything on the market. It's just so fast. A13 is even arguably better than the Snapdragon 8 at a low to mid-range GPU clock speed. And after that, Apple slightly slowing down the GPU improvements on A14, and then dropped the bombshell of A15, another huge leap on GPU. But this time, Qualcomm is not that far off, with their Snapdragon 8 Plus quickly closing the gap. I'm kinda wondering where A16 will be in this chart, but nevertheless, competition always benefits us as consumers. And what about Samsung? Is Exynos GPU catching up with these two? No, definitely not. Although Samsung tried very hard, they even asked AMD for help squeezing an AMD GPU into that Exynos 2200. Yeah, you can argue this is a desktop GPU inside. Specifically, an RDNA 2 GPU with 6 CUs running up to 1306 MHz. It even supports ray tracing, according to Samsung. How about that? But the thing is, RDNA 2 is already two years old by now. It's not like AMD is providing some alien tech here. They're already going to release RDNA 3 in several months, so this GPU is just not that superior as you might think comparing to Apple or Qualcomm. And to make things worse, Samsung manufactured their own chips, so you probably know that didn't go well. 
So Exynos 2200's GPU is kind of falling behind A13. The good news is it's not that bad in low to mid-range clock speed, but it's not going to destroy Qualcomm or Apple by any means. Still, it has some improvements comparing to Exynos 2100, which is even worse than Triple Eight. We also tested Google Tensor here, and since it's another victim of Samsung's fabrication, I'm not surprised of how mediocre this thing is. But at least Tensor's GPU is better than its CPU, being comparable to Triple Eight and Exynos 2100. Finally, let's take a look at MediaTek. MediaTek is utilizing ARM's Mali GPU architecture, but different from Exynos or Tensor, their chip is made by TSMC, and it seems like MediaTek is doing okay with their GPU. Their Dimensity 8100, although don't have tons of peak performance, is actually a lot more power efficient than Snapdragon 888 and A70. And their flagship Dimensity 9000 is not too far behind Snapdragon 8 Plus. The GPU of both MediaTek chip might not be as good as their CPU, but it's acceptable, I guess. Ah, <sighs> what a long video of analyzing. I hope you don't think it's too boring because we are reaching the end of this journey, and let me try to sum things up here. Samsung's fabrication really messed up with Team Android, and ARM's CPU architecture didn't really help either. As a result, Qualcomm Snapdragon chips suffered some serious recession on power efficiency, and both Samsung and Google struggled to make their own chips work. Fortunately, Qualcomm finally ditched Samsung, finding TSMC instead to manufacture Snapdragon 8 Plus, and it immediately showed their promise. Meanwhile, Apple is still dominating this whole thing, and MediaTek is quickly becoming an underdog of the smartphone market. So, is this result close to what you think before watching our video? Maybe leave some comment below to let me know, and if you like this whole analyzing thing, if you think it's useful, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. We'll definitely be motivated to make more solid stuff like this. Maybe next time we can talk about the lately launched A16. I don't know. You can give me some advice there. So that's it. I'm your host, Faye. This is Gko1, and see you next time. Bye.